nature of the relationship between behavior and character is dependent on, upon the nature of the modeling technique, whether or not it's explicit or generative. So an explicit, te explicit technique establishes a deterministic relationship between uh, the technique and the formal characteristics which are generated. Whereas generative techniques allow for architectural characteristics to emerge. And I guess this is one of the key things that we're interested in looking at. Another key subject for us is complexity. Now, a complex system is one in which uh, the individual elements within the system interact in order to give rise to a higher level of order at the macro scale. Now, I'm going to talk about this in greater length when we get to the work on swarm intelligence. The third concern that we're interested in is the nature of authorship, or how the nature of authorship changes within generative design. Now, the analogy that's often used to explain this is this type of wet foam. Now, wet foam, so this is foam that I made by seeing the type of photograph. Now, foam is, you, of course, you can never make the same piece of foam twice. Um, you can never control, there's whole things you can't control when you make foam. You can't control exact topology. You can't control how many cells there are. You can't control dimension. So these are things that we typically do have a high level of control over within architecture. So if we lose control of those, I guess one of the questions is, what do we begin to gain control of? And so there's two levels of control. One is the control of the rules that underlie the system. The second one is how those rules are deployed. So in this case, the rules that underlie the generation of wet foam is obviously physical laws that have got to do with surface tension and, uh, and pressure, and where these two things negotiate. Now, of course, when you when you generate this, there's a series of parameters that you can, I guess you can modify in order to generate different densities, etc. Now, this is the same case with, with generative architecture. It gets to the point where you end up controlling the characteristics of what you design rather than controlling the explicit dimensions of topology. So this is, I guess, a lead-in into the first two sets of projects. Now, a lot of the work that we do never really finds, I guess, any sort of successful resolution in the first project, so a lot of the techniques operate across a series of projects. Most of those seem to operate in pairs. So these first two come out of something we describe as wet foam geometry. Now, this is actually the second project that came out of that system. Um, and it was a project that was, it's really an algorithmic strategy rather than individual project. It was never meant to be um, a single instance or a single building, but um, a single instance in the possibility of, uh, of a strategy. So this was commissioned by a Polish cultural foundation called Beximania, and they were asking us to what, what strategies we could develop for the hyperdensification of Warsaw. So the project was really, I guess, playing with the normative notions of figure ground, and we're interested in positing a technique in which we have a schizophrenic relationship between, I guess, formal characteristics on either side of the surface. So it's a little bit hard to see on this particular slide, but maybe we'll shift forward. Um, so the notion that on one side of the surface we could have a have a radically different type of form character to the other. And so well, while they're, they're sharing the same, well, different sides of the same membrane, um, they're capable of generating extremely different effects. The other concern we had is a concern for, for exploring or generating gradient shifts between normative conditions and basic Now, there are two parts of this, I guess, the generative process that operates in this project. One is about the distribution of, of cells, and the other is about the form characteristics of those cells. So on the one hand, one I describe as relatively generative um, and so topologically free. The other one is something I describe as being much more parametric and operating on sort of gradient field of difference. That's something we'll I'll, I guess I'll look at in greater depth as we move forward. This is the first project that came out of that study in wet foam geometry. This was a pavilion for, uh, it's, it's named Parachute Pavilion. It was a competition that we did in Brooklyn uh, about five, five or six years ago. Now, so this was also interested in, um, I guess, the interplay between uh, positive and negative space, how these things can be understood as having pressure upon each other. So this sort of negotiation between uh, surface tension and pressure. Now, at the time, we were, we were reading Stan Allen, who we were interested in this essay um, talking about the shift from object to field. And the idea that instead of being interested in objects per se, we were really interested in what is the space between those objects. And so we started to look at what type of geometries are capable of, I guess, dealing with um, a, 
as object person of the thing that's being designed. Now, when designing pavilions, of course, pavilions are often seen as a precursor to shifts in, in architecture. Now, because the, the pavilion is inherently an, an object type thing, uh, we were interested in how we can shift away from this, and hence some of our interest in these geometries. So we became interested in how we could uh, understand the side of the charge and the potential, and look at the way we can develop almost an encodes of hot and cold parts of the side and development convection system in order to develop an emergent distribution, or in this case, of, of the cells, which we have a programmatic pattern. So some idea there might be some sort of turbulent relationship that exists within this. Uh, these cells then took on on certain programs, but in the end, of course, it ended up looking like an object. So, a lot of the projects I'm going to present, I'm going to be presenting as experiments which failed. Maybe this has almost failed because it was a uh, So, uh, this is a uh, demonstrates some attempt to sort of get a weave of program through this building. I won't show any floor plans today. But one of the things we're really interested in is that it was the, the dominant nature of, form, of the sort of spatial or form characteristics which became far more important than any particular distribution of points. So regardless in the end of, of how complex the distribution of the uh, convection system became, in the end the building was always read by the type of geometry that was then instantiated upon that point set. Okay, there's, I'd like to define uh, three different methodologies for embedding intelligence within geometry. So I'm going to try to describe it through three simple uh, lattice type projects. Now the first is embedding intelligence or decision making or responsiveness into a priori topology. The second is extracting geometry from unstructured fields. And the third is the highway conditions. I guess we see um, certain problems with the first of these, first two of these. And a lot of our work in the last, the last couple of years has tried to engage this third category. So we see this as almost like the poster child or like the um, a classic example of the first category. And the first category and its problems, I guess. This is what I describe as a very parametric project. Uh, it has a, an already set a priori topology. So this sort of surface is described explicitly. The surface is then tiled with a, a pseudo Voronoi tiling. Um, then it's put in a field of, of influence. So it's a set of attractors, which then each each cell has a, uh, I guess, well, each tessellation has a cell which is instantiated, and then this instantiated cell responds to its, its part of the field of attractors. So you can see at some points the, um, the cells are fatter or thinner, or they're, they're sharper or rounder. Uh, but ultimately, all possibilities are already contained within the starting condition. There's a set of limits that are set up for that particular cell, which, of which we know that it can't extend. And so this is something I would describe as inherently, it's a, a linear relationship. There's a linear relationship between its environment and the particular geometric instantiation of the cell. Uh, and it's also, I would consider it to be a very limited way of working because there's nothing that's, that's well, I would, I guess I would describe it as not being generative. Doesn't have the capable of something, the capability of something emerging from within the system. So these are these are projects that, um, in fact, these are all projects that I undertook while I was a student at Columbia. Okay, the second project is looking at the way the individual cell responds to its environment, and also the way the individual cell begins to affect the overall geometry. So once again, it's a it's a piece of geometry that's responding to a field of attractors. Now you can see at some points it's able to generate a a sort of a thinner and other parts like a, a wider um, geometry, but ultimately, once again, all possibilities already contained within starting topology. The third of these is this is another lattice. So this has a more complex way of generating differentiation, uh, but the initial topology is, is once again an a priori condition. So there's a certain type of, of topology which is set out, and what underlies this, instead of being a linear relationship to a, its environment, this is now the differences generated in the system through something known as a cellular automata. So this is where individual cells are interacting with each other in order to give rise to an emergent pattern. So on the one hand, we can describe the pattern as emergent, but then its instantiation is, um, is linear and parametric. Okay. 
So I guess in a way I'm going to try and go through this presentation almost with an increased level of complexity within the methodologies. So this project was a collaboration with Michelle Roskin, a um, Mexican architect. Now, he came to us and had a, a project for a pedestrian bridge in the south of Mexico. Now, the bridge was supposed to be in part, well, in, in part it's a pedestrian bridge, in part it's supposed to be a gateway to the city, so it's over a major highway. Now, a lot of, when we received the project, a lot of the conditions were already set. Uh, the plan was more or less set, which we tweaked a little bit. Um, its, its type was set in that it had to be a concrete box beam. So in a way, our role in the project was a rather limited one, but it was about how do we generate a pattern, which is um, a structural pattern, and what we're interested in is how can we make a bridge which is not about, I guess, a diagram which is resisting load. If you think about a lot of bridges, what they're attempting to do is really the inverse of the, of the bending of the, of the beam, effectively. What we're interested in is how can we have a much more distributed set of elements in order to distribute load, in, well, presumably in a non-linear way. Our other interest was how do we get away from a series of patterns which become tend to become cliches because they're they're deterministic, and these are things like any any other type of um, time patterns that we know, or things like Voronoi. All those systems, because they're so they have such a deterministic relationship between the, their rules and their results, um, they become instantly recognizable or indexable. So what we're, we're interested in is how could the pattern begin to be, to be generative. This is an extremely simple algorithm. This is a, it's a growth algorithm. It's, it can be generalized as a, a Lindemeyer system or an L system. Now, it was originally developed by Astrid Lindemeyer to look at the, the growth of plants. Now, so it's a simple algorithm which is looking at the way a line can bifurcate at a certain angle. It can begin to respond to the other lines that it, they can see, as well as things outside of itself. So in this way, we can talk about it as being, in part, or predominantly morphogenetic, that is, it has its own internal logic, but also morphodynamic, as in it's responding to its, its context, things outside of itself. Okay, this is one of the very first projects we did in the office, so um, it's always a little bit embarrassing to show very important work. But I think it's useful to show because this is almost take, this is now taking the second category of work, where if the, the lattice projects were really about a priori topology, this is looking at the way Geometry can be extracted from an unstructured field. So this was a, a sketch for a, for a bathhouse in Melbourne, and we're interested in trying to generate, I guess, very porous or complex topologies. And the way these topologies, we're interested in the way these topologies relate to, to circulation. So it's, it was for a bathhouse, as I said. Now, what we're trying to look at is the way we can consider space not to be something which is sort of empty, but instead space which is, which is dense and charged with we saw this as taking an existing building volume, um, filling it with space rather than considering it's empty space, and then looking at the way that space or that matter can be uh, eroded through a system of programmatic self-organization. So basically looking at the various different programs, the way those programs interact, and then uh, as they sort of begin to settle into, into some sort of logical distribution through, um, I guess through a, a sort of a physics engine, it was able to create a particular type of spatial condition through that erosion then generate these types of services. Okay, so what we're particularly interested in is, as I said, how we generate uh, a porous topology, and then the way that that is not just something which is seen as um, a sort of surface condition or as an object, but really something which has a, a major impact on the way circulation operates in the flow of space. And the other thing that we began to realize when we were developing this project was that the tools that you use to extract geometry from an unstructured field have a massive impact on the types of, of well, I guess the reading of the project, the types of geometry that you're capable of generating. So in this project, we were using something which is known as isosurfacing. So this is a medical imaging, originally a medical imaging technique, and it's used for taking CAT scans of the body and then extracting different thresholds of tissue, so whether it's, it's skin or bone or flesh or organs. Uh, so we're using this to try and take the, the stack of eroded images and then to try and extract a, a threshold or a series of thresholds within that. Now one of the things about this technique is, as I said, I don't consider any technique or any algorithm to be benign in any way, but all these algorithms have certain tendencies or, or behaviors. And so this one has a tendency to generate things which are, are very bodily, naturally, given what it was originally written. Now this is actually quite in contrast to a lot of the 
uh, a lot of the other work we were doing at the time, which was looking at minimal surface and, uh, well, I really should say surface minimization. So looking at the way you could actually calculate the energy of, of, um, of surfaces. So one of the things we became interested in is how do you actually have a, a much closer reading of form? So it's not to consider all, all complex geometries or complex topologies to be, to be the same, but to actually look at, do they become, are they, are they minimal, do they have a, or a sort of a thicker viscosity, which is the way I, can, I would describe that, uh, that previous project. Okay, so the, um, the next set of projects, in fact, all the projects I'm gonna talk about today, um, are dealing with, with swarm intelligence, or multi-agent algorithms. And what I really want to do is try, try and posit a behavioral design methodology, one in which design intent operates through local behaviors rather than explicit description or parametric manipulation of form and organization. So this approach involves encoding simple architectural decisions within a distributed system of autonomous computational entities or agents. Uh, it, and it's in, it is the interaction of these agents and the local decisions that self organize design intent giving rise to a form of collective intelligence and emergent behavior at the global scale. So, so in a way, it's like, it's, it's trying to take your intention as a designer and distribute them, and then say, how can a series of micro-design intentions then begin to interact to give rise to some type of emergent architecture? So our interest in this is, is manifold. Partly it's an interest in negotiation of complex problems. So how can we use this system to solve whether there's structural concerns or self-organization program? We see it as an opportunity to rethink hierarchies within design. So whether these are infrastructural hierarchies of urbanism or the tectonic hierarchies of architecture. Uh, partly it's an interest in teasing out the effects of formal characteristics of these, <coughs> of these emergent algorithms. And partly it's engagement with, with a wider contemporary concern for formation. So we see this contemporary concern extending from um, fields such as biology through to ge geopolitical concerns such as Negri's concept of multitude. Okay, so this, this interest evolved out of uh, the research field of swarm intelligence. Now, swarm intelligence is an artificial intelligence term um, which describes the collective behavior of decentralized or self-organizing systems. Now, it was originally coined to describe cellular, <coughs> cellular robotics in the 1980s, but now it's become a much more widely used term to describe any, any distributed system in which a set of collective entities interact and give rise to a higher level of order. So the, the typically cited biological examples include uh, bird flocking, schools of fish, social insects, and slime mold. Now it's, it's worth us noting very briefly about slime mold. Slime mold is a, it's a single cell organism which is interacting locally. So it interacts through both vibration and the excretion of a, of a chemical. And although the individual cell, of course, has extremely, extremely low level intelligence, through um, through very, very many interactions, it can then actually solve very complex problems. So this is an example of it solving, I guess, a neural path system from a distributed distributed um, collection of cells, generating an emergent hierarchy in order to find a food source. Now, the kind of classic, um, I guess, anecdote or story about this is test that was done in which uh, a relatively simple maze was covered with slime mold and food sources were placed at each end. And then over an eight hour period, the slime mold was able to self-organize to find the shortest path through, through the maze. So it's this kind of, I guess, self-organization that we're interested in and how it can solve, both solve architectural problems and generate formal effects that we become interested in. Now, the computational basis of this is largely come to the work of Craig Reynolds. In the mid 80s, Craig Reynolds was, and still is, a um, uh, I guess an animator who works for Sony. And in 1987, he published a, what's now a seminal article in SIGGRAPH uh, about the distributed behavioral models for simulation. And what he was looking at is, I guess he was originally tasked with trying to look at modeling the way uh, birds flock or schools of fish. And originally, it was always considered that each of these entities were following some sort of, each of these birds were following a lead bird or a lead fish. Um, and then every, t every attempt to try and model it in this way always failed, so you could never replicate a behavior. Through closer observation, you realize that actually it's a, it's a distributed collective system where every bird is, is interacting with its neighbors on a, on a local scale. And 
he's, he wrote what it, I guess is now the sort of three classic rules of flocking, which is separation, cohesion, and alignment. And so, I, I guess as you can see in the diagrams, it's this idea that, that each entity, each agent, each bird, only has a certain range of vision. So one of the things that becomes critical is actually global ignorance. It's this idea that to develop a complex system, you must not know everything about the, about the entire system. You can only have, sort of have some sort of local understanding. So of course our interest is, all right, how do we begin, if this is the rules of flocking, our interest is, how do you begin to write the rules for architecture? And this is not like a, you know, some desire for like the rules or the laws of architecture, but simply to say, what, what is our intent? How can we, can we break it down? And then begin, begin to look at how that interacts to generate something, I guess, greater than, than itself. Now, there are two main ways that we can see this operating. What I've described is the agency of matter. And the second is the agency of the organization of matter. And both of these can be described through the analogy of social insects. So the agency of matter can be described where it's actually ma architectural matter, or in this case, structural matter, which has some agency. So it has some ability to be able to interact with its neighbors. So this is obviously an ant bridge, where the ants use their, their bodies or their geometry to generate a larger structure. The second is the agency of the organization of matter. This is looking at the way Matter doesn't have any particular agency, but there's a set of agents which move matter around. So it's looking at the termite mound and the way that it's the interaction between the termite piece of mud, the pheromone injects it into that mud, um, and the way that they then gives rise to the termite mound. Now, this is described as a stick merging system. So it's a system in which the agents don't actually directly interact with each other, but they interact with each other through the thing that they're, they're constructing. Okay, so we've tried to look at these at several scales. I'm going to start from, I guess, the larger scale and, and then work back. Uh, this was a, a very diagrammatic project, which was really, in a way, commissioned by, by Neil Leach. When it came about as a, a conversation about the role of agent-based design at an urban scale. Now, a lot of our work has always operated at a, a much smaller scale, but we've been convinced for a long time, I guess, that it's actually probably at the urban scale which swarm intelligence is most important. So, and to think about the urban scale in terms of swarm intelligence, it means instead of thinking about a set of sequential hierarchies where you think about things like land use and infrastructure and slowly work down into um, decreasing through decreasing scales, it's the idea that you think about urbanism from the most micro element. How can the smallest element of urbanism begin to interact with each other to give rise to a collective order at the, the scale of the city? So this is a project we attempted to test um, well, I guess on a relatively small side, it's the Melbourne Docklands, which has been, uh, I guess, redeveloped over the last 15 years, and we're looking at how else this could be developed. So, in a way, this is an attempt to try and shift away from the notion of the master plan and shift that towards the idea of the master algorithm or master strategy. And we looked at it through three different techniques. One was the self-organization of circulation networks. One was the organization of program, the other one is the organization of public space. Now, we've broken these down into separate diagrams, I guess for clarity. But one of the things that became crucial to us is that we don't see these things as being separate or sequential. So it's not a matter of that one precedes the other, which develops a hierarchy, which often happens in, well, in all forms of design. Um, but it's to say that what if all these things were understood as an ecology? So how could infrastructure, how could, say, circulation affect program and program affect circulation? This is something we've then continued to test at a small scale. Um, perhaps the clearest version of this to look at is the self-organization of the circulation networks. If this animation runs. Okay, so this is just this is a stick merging system, so it's looking at the way um, agents leave a set of trails, and those agents then uh, respond to those trails and leave further trails. So it's a way that agents don't interact with each other, but they interact with their environment and change their environment through that interaction. So this, I guess one thing to note, this should not be really concerned or confused with the mimicry of people. We don't see agent-based design as a attempt to try and understand what, what people will do and then respond to that. We see it as a way of saying, not what is the agency of a person that might circulate, but what is actually the agency of the circulation, and that agency is design agency. This interest in, in the self-organization of, of program and circulation is something we've also worked with the students on. 
this is a uh, work that's come out of a, a studio that I teach us in Berlin, in the University of Pennsylvania. And this was looking at a very similar sort of stick merging algorithm, and then the way that would then interact with, I guess, the interaction between program and circulation, and the way that where a threshold could then be extracted from that. So the threshold between various programs. So this becomes the various internal position or the topology, the spatial topology of that project. Um, that same technique is then used in order to generate the articulation. Um, so motion, the way the structure might work on that project. Now this goes back to our first, well I guess that I should say, our very first attempt at uh, swarm-based or agent-based architecture. This was dates back from 2001 in, um, in my thesis project, and this was really looking at the self-organization of the program. Now in some ways, we understand form as the organization of matter, so we actually see the whole of design in some ways being about organization rather than about, um, rather than about geometry. I think often we're understood as being formalists, and of course we're certainly extremely interested in form, but our interest in form would probably describe um, more in the way that I think Sam McQuinter talks about it when he says that um, he tries to differentiate between um, formalism, what he describes as true formalism, which is interested in formation rather than interested in shape. So, um, anyway, maybe that's an attempt to try and say we're, we're not simply dealing with geometry. Okay, so this brings me to the third category of, that I outlined earlier on. When I said the first was a priori, I guess embedding intelligence into a priori topology. The second was how do you extract geometry from unstructured fields, which is sort of the, the erosion and isosurfacing technique. This is, and I, we, we see both those are problematic. As I said, the first one is deterministic, um, in that all possibilities are given in the starting condition. The second one becomes very reliant on the particular nature of the algorithm that extracts the geometry. And I think those algorithms are relatively limited. Um, this is an attempt to say, okay, how can topology generate, um, how, can, how can there be a sort of a constant engagement between the formation of topology and that topology's influence on an unstructured field. So this is something we've worked on again with in our office and also with students. And maybe it might be worth just starting off by, by showing um, the work of one, of one of my students. This is um, a student from, it's a couple of years ago now, from Syak and Bill Christensen. But I think it, it remains a really good example of, of this way of working. Now what's happening here is that there's a, um, a set of points which are I guess, well, a set of points which are agents. Those agents are attempting to negotiate a relationship with each other, but they're also controlled by uh, this topology, topology being the line network. Now, this is not a topology which is set in a priori condition, but it's a topology that can form and reform. Okay, so this is um, a similar algorithm was used to, to generate this project. Now, this project is a it was a competition that we lost. Um, we've lost all of our competitions, but this one was lost at least to Rem Kulhas. And this is, um, well, in fact, we've lost all of our competitions that we've actually entered. We seem to have more competitions that we start and we end up finishing months, many months later. I think we seem to get so sort of distracted by the process and have a hard time realizing these in, within certain given time frames. It might also contribute to why we don't have a lot of clients. self-deprecating but in case there are potential clients in the audience. Okay, so um, okay, so this project consists of, of three parts. It's got a, um, the, the base is a, a fractally subdivided, um, I guess it's all the back of house stuff, so it's um, the fly towers. So this is a performing arts center, so it has three auditoriums, it's got a series of obviously fly towers and a lot of back of house um, requirements. The, um, the second part of it is auditoriums, and the third part is the, the green shiny roof. Um, I'll start with the fractally subdivided base. Um, we developed a very simple recursive algorithm, which is looking at the way a simple operation can be run over and over again, which of course is what recursion is, and in order to generate a series of varied forms, which operates at a series of different scales. Um, um, so on the one hand, it was used on the, uh, on the fractally subdivided base. Um, it's also used in the auditoriums in order to generate, uh, I guess, increasingly finer levels of, of detail and for well, both an ornamental desire and also for acoustic treatment. Um, so the first one's Playhouse, this one is 
that in the Opera House, that space. And I guess that was partly some, some desire to get back to sort of the richness of detail that existed in some of the world's great um, historical opera houses. So, back to the roof though. This is the thing that was really, I guess, important in terms of our methodological development. Now, this roof has, and this, this is something I'll come back to on the final project, but this was our first attempt to really look at what is the relationship between explicit design and generative design. And part of this came down to the fact that, I guess when we started out, being, I guess, very naive recent graduates, we had this, this belief or desire that somehow all of architecture could be developed through a generative methodology. That we could, we could set up the rules and the conditions from which architecture could emerge. And as we began to develop the work, of course we realized that, that not only is that prohibitively difficult, there's a whole lot of things which generative systems are not particularly good at solving. Um, but instead, these are things that we've developed, we as architects have developed considerable skill or knowledge on. So this was an attempt to look at how we could negotiate between explicit design and generative design. So the roof, part of this roof is the roof model, um, mainly those parts over the auditoriums. Well, in fact, initially the whole thing is explicit model. And then it's given a series of weightings. So part of the, the roof is able to reform its topology, like we saw in the, um, the blue network um, app book. Uh, part of the roof becomes incredibly stiff, so it can't actually move. So at a certain point, uh, uh, around the middle where the, the public circulation works, uh, the roof begins to break the topology. Now this is one of the, the early projects which we were interested in this relationship between uh, line and surface, and the way the surface can begin to break down from the line. Now, in the end, so these are a few, a few early studies of looking at, um, at this, this breakdown of the line and surface. Yeah, this is something, another project we consider to be a failure in this respect. And maybe the failure of this project has kind of led to the sort of continuous um, revisiting of this problem, this relationship between line and surface. And so the reason why we consider this problem to be a failure is that instead of being a sort of seamless shift between line and surface, which is the ambition, it actually becomes really a space frame that, that detaches from the surface. So it's, um, I guess you can describe it as a space frame or a network that emerges from a surface but definitely not a sort of um, surface to line seamless condition. Okay, so if that was dealing with the agent, the hybrid agency of, of points and topologies, this next student project from Columbia, this is dealing with uh, the agency of a mesh. So the idea that an agent doesn't have to be a point, but the agent Agency could be given to something like a surface. In this case, uh, the particular agency is the design to try and try and generate complex topologies and try to um, to connect to its I guess, to its neighbor. It generates these types of um, slightly grotesque red topologies. Okay. So if that was dealing with the agency of a surface. This next project is dealing with the agency of, of a line. Now this is a project which uh, it's part of a series of studies we describe as the fibrous tower. Projects. Now, the original version of this was actually started as a collaboration we began with um, with Rockin, and it was for a project in originally in Guiyang in China. Um, I'm not going to show that project today, but this is sort of a second version, second iteration, which I guess well, it's further exploration of the original ideas. Now, so the agency of a line. This type of agency has been dealt with before, certainly. Um, work of Priota, an experiment which I'm sure you're all aware of, which is where he's taking a series of woolen strands, uh, lengthening them, which connects nodes together. He lengthens those strands by 10%, uh, dips them in water, and it becomes the, um, it's the surface tension of the water which acts as the agency in this case. So it's the surface tension of water which draws these, these threads together. And in doing so, they self-organize. So this is, sort of a, this is definitely a nonlinear process. Uh, of self-organization which leads to a minimal path system. So we're interested in how we can start to generate a, um, a series of algorithms which are not so much about minimization, but about the way, what is the behavior of a line and how does it want to respond or how can it program to respond to, to its neighbors. Now part of, so this project and this whole series of projects is about developing uh, load-bearing structural skins for, um, 
for a tower. Now, part of our interest is, okay, how does a, how does a hierarchy emerge? In, in a similar way to the way the hierarchy emerges within Slightball, how can a hierarchy of structure begin to emerge within the tower? Um, but also, how can this can be seen as a polyscalar condition? So, how does the same operation happen at smaller and smaller scales so that it can generate uh, the largest level of structural hierarchy right down to a more fine-grained elemental level? Now, you know, to be critical of the project, it, it only goes through uh, a certain range of, of um, I guess, subdivision, which is something we've begun to try and deal with, and we, I guess we deal with a lot with it, uh, our students in trying to kind of increase this level of, um, of polyscalar behavior. So detail of the facade, and then uh, a section showing how this, this skin at some points is extremely thin, operates purely structural structure, at other points um, begins to become, um, become spatial. So offer the possibility for some, perhaps balconies or, or vertical gardens. This is the second iteration of that project. Well, sorry, second iteration I'm going to show. It's really the third iteration of the project. Uh, and this is dealing with sort of a higher level of, of agency, I guess, and trying to look at um, higher levels of self-organization. But once again, it's, this is, a, I guess, a more extreme version of the project, less about durability. Maybe one thing I'll note is just to go back and say that, that this original scheme, although we definitely describe its, um, its articulation as very complex, this actually in part grew out of the experience I had working with, or working, I should say working for Jesse Riser, and working on a project of theirs, which was a, um, a concrete exoskeleton tower in Dubai. It had a relatively simple um, perforation scheme. But one of the things I quickly realized about that is the things that architects tend to want to standardize or optimize um, are not necessarily things that the construction industry are interested in having optimized. So one of the things I quickly realized about the project we were working on in Dubai was that in that particular project, even though every opening was standardized to a certain extent, every, all the openings were, the formwork was milled. And since everyone was milled, they're all they could just as cheaply or easily be um, entirely different. So this was really an experiment to say, okay, how far can we push this idea that that it's actually quite a feasible construction technique to develop um, relatively simple shuttering, and then between that shuttering have, I guess, very complex formwork. But because it's all, um, I guess, all computer milled, it becomes relatively efficient. This project, however, took on none of those constraints. So this was looking at the way that exoskeleton then begins to to weave inside and try to generate some notion of um, of continuous atrium. Or atrium. So one of the things that I've alluded to already, and maybe it's a good time to clarify, is how behavioral design methodologies can challenge the hierarchies that exist within design. Now, at urban scale, I just, we try to develop a system in which we have an ecology of systems. So it's how does um, circulation networks interact with uh, self-organization of, of program or land use, etc. Um, the second system was a set of uh, polyscalar systems, well, a single polyscalar system, which is operating in the fibrous tower studies. And the third, which I'm going to get to shortly, is the speciation of systems. So, these details of, of polyscalar behavior that's generated within the tower. Okay. This is work that came out of a, a workshop that run at CETA in Copenhagen. Uh, this is once again looking at the, I guess, the behavior of an agent. And this is much more of a formal project that's interested in really capturing the behavior in, um, in a generation of form. Now there's two levels of agency that operate here. One is the, the agency of the line, the other is the, um, is the agency of, of the surface, and where those, those line, the surfaces of those lines begin to, um, to respond to each other. This is another student project. This is the work of um, work that came out of that same studio that Cecil Bauman and I teach at UPenn. Now, this project came about from the desire to try and create architecture purely from line. And in doing so, it has a sort of embedded hierarchy within it, um, in the way that some lines operate differently to other lines. Um, but the idea was that it tries to, to blur tectonic hierarchies. And this is something we're becoming increasingly interested in. So it ends up looking like a, a rotting piece of flesh, but it's um, it engages with a whole set of 
difficult problems. And one is, how do you generate coherent surface from a line, which is a topological entity which has no understanding of surface? So how do you develop surface and volume from these things? Okay, um, the last in the series of, um, of these, well, not the last, but um, another project which deals with trying to destabilize the hierarchies that exist within design. And this particular destabilization has got to do with challenging the way that contemporary component design works. Now, a lot of, a lot of contemporary architecture in schools like, that are being taught in schools like this or at um, Penn or Columbia are dealing with the way there's a set of hierarchical steps through which you look at components. So it's the idea that you have a component, which is then uh, instantiated into a substrate. So we looked at that, I guess, early on in the presentation, where the, um, the component was instantiated into the, the Voronoi tessellation of a, of a surface. And in, in those types of projects, the component is always subservient to its underlying substrate. What we're interested in here is, how can a component not be subservient to a substrate, but actually a component have an individual ability to interact to then give rise to not only a local differentiation, but give rise to emergent order at the larger scale. So this is a, I guess it's an ornamental study. This was a study for a, a museum, uh, another competition, um, a museum for of Polish history in, um, in Warsaw. And we're interested in trying to develop an ornamental uh, system for a ceiling. And how that, how that ceiling kind of extends from being just a surface to becoming spatial. So we can see here, like at the larger scale, I would describe some sort of uh, coherent emergent order that's operating. Um, then as you go through a series of um, sequential scales, you begin to see that order is emerging at, at each of those scales. So in, well, let me just go back here. So in certain parts, you can see the way um, it's almost a periodic nature to parts of this. Then there's other parts which generate which are capable of generating symmetry, and again, other parts which generate something which you might describe as a, as a singularity. Now, the symmetry in this type of thing is not encoded into the rules. There's no symmetry in the, in the component nor in the, in the rules, but simply an emergent outcome of the interaction of, of different components. That's the fact that a series of components are interacting in such a way that, that they generate something, which is not a true symmetry, but a, a, a new symmetry. Okay. Okay, and this is looking at it in the, in the finest grain of detail. Now, one of the things that we've become increasingly interested in in this work is a sort of a search for, it's hard to describe, but a search for strangeness. Now, it's this, and this almost becomes the way of evaluating the things that we make. We sort of begin to ask ourselves, is it sufficiently strange? And that question is not about trying to make things that are weird in any way, but it's simply to say that um, I think a lot of, a lot of architecture is actually mimetic. It's attempting to, um, to follow codified norms or styles. And so something which is beautiful in, I mean, I would define it as always being something which is normative. So what we're interested in is not the development of things which are, which are beautiful, but things which we can't yet qualify. We can't work out whether we yet like them or not. So I think this is a good example of this. When we developed this, we were not sure whether this, we considered this to be successful or whether we, we liked it or whether we thought it was beautiful or thought it was ugly. We definitely thought it was strange. And so these are the things that we're, we're pursuing. Okay. This was um, one of the uh, project instantiations, the failed instantiation from Ruth in Poland. Now, this is the last project I want to talk about. It's a new project which has just been finished, which I haven't talked about before. Um, this is a collaboration with Tom Wiscombe sitting in the front, and his office emergent architecture. So look, this really arose from a set of mutual sensibilities or common research interests. So both of us have an interest in the relationship between, say, surface and strand. And so we decided to tackle a, um, another competition, which we lost, which was for the um, it's a pavilion, for, which was supposed to be the centerpiece for the expo in 2010 in Korea. Now, the way this, this project is working, it's, um, it's a series of, of volumes, a series of membranes, which then have a, not quite a stretched, but um, a type of, uh, I guess, monocoque shell, which bridges between those. 
So it's deep pleats and, and I guess mega armatures that create structural stiffness in that shell. So if we look at it in this diagram. And then within the membrane, there's a series of, I guess, more minor pleats, which are operating as, uh, as air beams to give some sort of structural stiffness to the membrane. Now, the thing that increasingly became interesting about this was really a sort of negotiation between our different design methodologies and a constant shifting between explicit modeling and uh, generative algorithmic operations. So I think Tom describes this as, as messy computation, because I describe it as sort of a, a very opportunistic process. In many ways, I think the project was really a struggle to try and develop a complex, coherent, and highly differentiated architectural language. So it's a constantly move, sort of moving in and out of, of scripting back to modeling, and seeing how these, these things mutually inform each other. So it was how can the output of a script then inform the way you model something, or the way that you, you almost codify the set of operations that you use to model. And then how does a series of, um, of things that you model then get codified back into uh, an automated process such as, such as an algorithm? So and parts of this project, I guess, are, are more or less um, So this is, um, this is a small animation that's looking at the formation of the, the pleats, which are the air beams on the um, EFT membranes. So this is an agent-based algorithm. Um, so we can see that I guess, the path of the agents, the way those agents are responding to each other in order to try and maintain certain distances between each other. Um, and then, once again, a line has a set, uh, certain agency to it once it's been created, and it's able to then respond to lines around it to form Sometimes striated conditions, and other times cellular conditions. Now, I generate this type of, um, oh, I guess, micro pleats in the laser to become air beams. Now, the, the monocoque shell has a slightly a different type of process, I guess. This is something which, I guess, our initial intention was, well, maybe I don't know if it's necessarily agree, but I mean, certainly my initial intention with, with this is to try and take the same operation that generated the, the glazing and try and then generate the, uh, the articulation of the monocoque shell. However, the monocoque shell's topology is extremely complex, and because of this, it doesn't have the same, I guess, simple substrate that the, um, the monocoque, um, the, the membrane does have. And so, any attempt to try and simulate or try and generate uh, these as paths of agents quickly kind of broke down because the agents didn't really have the intelligence or the, you couldn't really write a set of conditions to allow them to negotiate such a complex environment. So what ended up happening was it was really a sort of a shift back and forth between something that would get run as a, uh, an agent algorithm and that would then get codified into a, a set of modeling operations. Um, so in a way it's a form of, um, of iterative crafting. Now, one of the things that we're interested in, and I guess this is an extension of both the research that Tom and I have, have been developing, which is uh, the surface and strand relationship and the way uh, strands, in this case, emerge from surfaces. And we're also interested in the way it's described as, I guess, polyscalar uh, geometry or topology. At what point is a, one of the one of these members considered a strand? At what point is it considered to be, uh, I guess, a large topological move of a, of a surface? And then with, within the, the monocoque shell, a series of, I guess, the smaller membranes or smaller bubbles of space exist for, um, for more tightly controlled or enclosed exhibition spaces. So, I should say this is an exhibition. One of the interests, and this is something that, um, that was, I guess, really more of a, I think Tom was far more instrumental in is really the the way the building can be able to, or the way the building relates to its territory, and this idea that um, object and territory begin to develop a feedback loop. So it's it's really how does the um, how does the object affect its environment, the environment affect the object, in a way that eventually the building appears as though it's beginning to emerge from from its territory. And so this involved, um, I guess, I, I I don't know whether it's safe to say, but um, I think Tom's perhaps the, the 
founder of underwater landscape design now. And um, it's all a matter of what went into, into developing how this relates to its, um, to its underwater environment. Now, I would describe, so this is really the, the second major attempt um, that I've had to look at what is this relationship between the explicit and the generative. And it's been extremely interesting working with, with Tom in this respect. Um, and maybe the first is the Taipei project. But in many ways, that relationship was really um, not a feedback loop. It was simply that some parts were described as explicit, described explicitly, other parts were allowed to, um, to reform or be generative. Whereas in this project, those two things were really much more in a, in a constant feedback loop where each would inform the other. It becomes a much messier way of working, a much slower way of working in many ways, but I think that it's actually a much more successful way of working in its ability to generate what I would almost describe as a inconsistent coherence or inconsistent consistency. This idea that even though there's an incredible inconsistency to the set of procedures, which is not the case when you write something algorithmically, which is any algorithm is entirely consistent. But here, because of its, I guess, the complexity of the topology, you couldn't maintain a, a design process which had that consistency. But at the same time, we're trying to develop a consistent or coherent form of language. So, and I also see this as an interesting way of um, dispelling a series of myths about, uh, or of dogmas that are often found with regard to generative architecture. I think it's certainly, and maybe, you know, maybe we, we were victims of this um, early on in our careers, I guess it still is extremely early on in my career, but um, this very sort of almost religious belief that um, there's something about, um, or something almost objective about uh, a procedural process, that somehow there's, um, it's more objective to have a, let's say an algorithmic or a scripted approach to something. Now I would, I would definitely refute this and say that um, in no way are we really I guess now in our work, interested in this idea that, um, that, that that could possibly be more objective. We see all design as an incredibly subjective act. And, and even whether it's like a messy computational process like this, or whether it's a, a more sort of straight algorithmic process in which there's always this sort of um, backwards and forwards. There's always this complex relationship to authorship. So it's always a matter of like writing code, see what it generates, rewrite the code. Um, it's always a feedback with the designer. It's not never something which is, is, is written and then deployed and there's some sort of acceptance of the, the generated thing. But um, I guess to conclude, some of the things that, that have, I guess come out of these projects, one is, um, is an interest in the intensity of, of the aggregation of, of matter or material and through these multi-agent systems it's possibility to destabilize tectonic legibility. Um, and the attempt to try and, through this destabilization, try to develop some sort of self-similar continuous architectural um, tectonic. Uh, and the other is that um, we have intense interest in formation in our work, but formation or form is not tied to the desire for an a priori knowledge or mimetic condition, uh, which I think is evident in a lot of contemporary formalism. But instead it's the outcome of the operation of a series of complex systems. So, in many ways, I, when I talk about this work, or I think about this work, I find myself thinking back 